All right. Welcome back from lunch. So, thanks for coming. Um, cool. Let's get this show on the road. This is a really full room. Holy crap. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Jason Vandenberg. I am a creative director at Ubisoft, which means that I make problems for a living. Uh, and I'm here to uh, talk about uh, acting like players. So I'm going to get started because i got a lot of stuff to get through. Um, so what? I'm going to give you a quick rehash. First quick question, how many people in this room saw my talk last year on the vault at all? Okay, about half the room, maybe a little bit less. Good. All right, so I'm going to do a quick intro for those of you who didn't see that, who are going, what is this all about? For the rest of you, you know, get on your phones and check your email or something. Uh, okay. Big Five. Big Five is a st uh, structure of human psychology that is being used by academia worldwide. I discovered this randomly about two years ago. I had no idea it existed. I was thrilled to find out about it. Big Five um, is, is, is five, five different uh, domains. Uh, openness to, hello, am I, why am I getting a do not freak on me PowerPoint? <laughs> Go. Why are you not going? There, no? Yeah, there we go. Okay, there we go. I was clicking on the wrong thing. Openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, uh, uh, agreeableness, and neuroticism. Uh, the, these are five different personality groups. If you're experienced in psychological theory, you'll be familiar with the sorts of things that these talk about. The reason I was excited about um, this particular model is that inside each of these are actually six what are known as facets. And these are far more specific um, and this means that altogether the system is really 30 different spectrums of human personality and motivation. I thought that was pretty cool. So what I've been doing is uh, I spent the last two years correlating these, and through correlation, um, I mean I have been doing interviews with people, uh, asking, doing the Big Five test, and then asking them about their play style, what they like in games. And I discovered that they correlate your personality test uh, will predict the kinds of games that you like. So the five domains of play are the names of the game features that will satisfy people with those motivations. So people who are open to experience like, gasp, new things in their video games. <laughs> I know that that sounds pretty obvious, but this work hadn't been done before, so here we are. Um, at the end of the talk last year, I um, pointed out that neuroticism, which is, we'll talk about in a minute, was a big question mark. It didn't really correlate, and I have more data on, uh, it didn't correlate at all. It didn't seem to in any of my interviews. Um, neuroticism uh, was, well, I'm going to get to it in a minute. So that's really all you need to know about the Big Five right now to understand the rest of the talk. That's the intro. What have I been doing since last year? The answer is pretty simple, more research. We're doing more research, but this time instead of just qualitative research where I was doing personal interviews, we actually started doing some quantitative research as well. We have, um, uh, my sister is, is a, a PhD psychologist, um, teacher at um, uh, University of Washington at DigiPen. She has been testing her classes. <laughs> and so we have made big tests, um, and we have been using students as guinea pigs uh, to find numbers to see if these correlations that we found in, quali in the qualitative research actually existed. Um, so it looks like this. We give them the test, uh, the, the ocean test, and then we give them a test that is the five domains test. You know, do you like these types of gameplay, do you, uh, et cetera? And what I have now is I have some numbers of correlation. They look like this, um, 0.42. This probably means nothing to you. It didn't mean anything to me when, when it was first presented to me. In correlation, a 1.0 is 100%, <laughs> uh, and a zero means none. So 0.42, that's pretty OK in, in uh, social um, sort of psychological study terms. It's pretty good. It's not great. Um, it means there's some noise in the data, but it's OK. 327. 5128, that's low, we need to fix that. Um, and then neuroticism came in at a whopping 0 0.15. This is precisely the same kind of results that the other guy who's done Big Five research um, uh, discovered. It was Nick Yee, uh, who did a big World of Warcraft um, uh, study, found pretty much the same thing. So neuroticism doesn't jive. What the hell is going on with that? This is where we were at the end. I'm going to quickly answer this question and then we'll get into the meat of the talk. Neuroticism it reflects the tendency to experience negative emotions. A high score in neuroticism is Woody Allen, who is like, bah, everything sucks every time something goes bad. And a low score is uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi, <laughs> who meets his death like this. Yeah, OK, bring it on. 
It's cool. I'm cool with that. Okay. Um, the problem that I had in my test was that in my conversations is that I would ask these people with high scores, what are your favorite games? And they would tell me Resident Evil. And I would say, right, oh, cool, that makes sense. You're like, you're freak, you get freaked out easily, right? So cool, that makes sense. And then I would ask the people with the low scores, and they would say, yeah, it's Resident Evil. And I'm like, I like, <laughs> okay, that makes sense, because yeah, you don't normally experience intense emotions, and so you like the, wow, help doesn't predict what game you're going to buy. This was the problem that um, we left uh, neuroticism with. I still called this domain threat, um, since that seemed about right. Turned out to be about right. We solved this problem. Here are the six um, facets of um, uh, neuroticism. Anxiety, uh, anger, hostility, depression. They're all the things that you would think they would be, based on these things. And what I realized this year in a conversation with one of my, uh, with my game designer, Pat Harris, who he, he was throwing out ideas about how to solve this thing, he pointed out that we already have a name for one of these. Anger hostility means that when something goes wrong, you freak out. Really? I have no idea what that's like. I don't do that, ever. Um, we have a word for that. <laughs> okay? We know about this. <laughs> I had to stop playing racing games because I broke my seventh controller. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's bad. So we know about this. When people experience anxiety, they will stop playing a game because of intimidation. When people who are, have a tendency towards depression uh, will uh, quit their game based on despair. Uh, um, if you've played Triple Town, uh, you've had the experience of, I've had this fantastic game and it's gone on for a week and a half and then I lose. And I go, <laughs> and I put it away. And then I always come back, of course, I always come back. I love Triple Town. Thank you, Dan, thank you. Um, uh, judgment, addiction, hurt. These are reasons why neuroticism, so threat, the domain of neuroticism, is a guide to the designer to explain why people will stop playing a game that they are otherwise enjoying. It's a warning. It's a warning. Even if you do everything else right and you get them to buy it and you put all the right features in there, if, you, if they're neurotic type people, if they have high scores in here, they, they're going to stop playing even though they like it. So that's cool. And it's enough for me today because I'm, I, for my purposes, it's not really the part of the psychology that I'm studying right now. So when we go, when, what, for the purposes of this talk, um, I'm going to take that one out because I'm more interested in talking about appeal right now. I want to focus the conversation on appeal. But for those of you who attended the talk last year, I kind of left it as an open question and I felt that I was obligated to then provide the answer. <laughs> so that was where we got. So we're gonna take that one off and we're just gonna talk about these four. Openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, and agreeableness. Okay, so since the talk that I gave, I've had this problem. I keep asking, I keep getting asked this question. Um, in, uh, I worked on Far Cry, Far Cry 3. Um, that was a moment um, that I remember vividly. I was going to give this, the talk I gave last year, I was walking across the floor, and the producer uh, shows up. His name is Dan Hay. If you know Dan, Dan is about six foot four, and he talks like this. And I'm like, hey, Dan, I'm going to GC. I'm going to give this presentation. And he says, oh, yeah? On what? Human psychology, blah, 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 blah. And Dan goes, well, what's it good for? <laughs> I was like, ah. <laughs> Now, I've actually had this conversation many, many, many times uh, since then, but it was really the conversation with Dan that stuck in my head because he's really terrifying as a person. Um, uh, and he's a good guy, uh, but what's it good for? What's it good for? Dan, look, here's the deal. I have these spectrums of personality, and I can tell you if your game satisfies these bands, of, of motivation, right? If your game kind of covers those areas, and then you test the gamer, and their scores fit in the, inside those things, then they're gonna like the game, Dan. And then, if they're outside, I can, I can tell you that they're not gonna like the game. Isn't that cool? So what? <laughs> What's it good for? <laughs> The implication, of course, being that I'm spending Ubisoft's money <laughs> uh, on this. So I had to answer this goddamn question. And I, I, am, I hope you don't think it's bragging when I tell you that it took me only 12 months and about 17 versions of the presentation to accomplish my answer. It was a bit of a chore. So here is my answer to the question. And 
This is my answer to the question for what psychology of all kinds is good for. This is not the big five, okay? I believe that it's only good for one real thing. There are many things that we can talk about in terms of statistics and you, you know, gathering and player modeling and all of that thing, but in terms of making the game, there's only one thing that this actually helps us with. Developing accurate empathy. Developing accurate empathy. And we devalue this because it is not a checklist. That's cool, I'm putting that aside. Here's the thing, our gamers, when we begin in our experiences, right, we start out in kind of this, maybe if we're, when we're young, we're like, ha ha, nerd, he likes video games, right? What the hell, right? Um, and then as we get into the business, we slowly evolve and we start to realize, okay, we have to understand how this gamer is thinking. How do we do this? What do they, what do they want? What do they want from us? And the job of the designer, the job of the designer <laughs> is to develop accurate empathy is to be able to understand what is going on inside of not just your head, not just the head of the guy next to you, but all of your players, in best case. Best case, all of your players. All of your players. I'm gonna hit that a point one more, one more time because there was a second guy who asked me an important question that I thought needed answering. Why am I doing this? Why? <laughs> Why have I done this for two and a half years? Why have I been chasing this? Why am I standing up here? Is it just attention? Do I just wanna feel important? It's not. Here's the problem. All gamers. Hopefully, these will be my players. Now, uh, the issue is, when I begin designing the game, these are the players I understand. I get these guys, right? But the variation in humankind means that these guys are ones that I want to understand, but I do not naturally. And my problem is, my goal is that if you pay for my game, you set the controller down satisfied, regardless of who you are. If, I, if you saw the poster and you bought this thing, I want you to go away satisfied. If you walked into the theater with a ticket, God damn it, it's my obligation to entertain you. <laughs> That's the covenant. That's what we've agreed to do. But I don't understand all of you guys. So, whoa. <laughs> Develop accurate empathy. This is my role, this is my task, this is my job as a designer. Develop accurate empathy so that I can understand a broader swath of humanity. The problem is, that's actually a really nice way of saying a completely different thing. We all have bias. And this is, gets in our way as a designer. Robert McKee is a script writing teacher. He said a fantastic thing. He says, if you're a writer, and this applies to designers, you, it's okay for you to go through your life and believe lies and misunderstand human beings and not confront the truth. That's okay. But if you're a writer or a designer, you are obligated to live truthfully and to design truthfully because your audience wants truth. That's what they want. So you have to overcome your personal bias. And it's hard. But we have this tool. And I'm gonna show you now how this works. So, how do we overcome personal bias? You go take the test. Let's imagine that you go and you take the big five test. This is your scores. Bang, 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 bang. Actually, you're gonna get more numbers than that, but just for the purposes of this, let's say those are your scores. Okay, what you're gonna do is you're gonna invert those scores. You're gonna flip them around, okay? Reverse them. Those are your empathy blind spots. Okay? Those are the parts of humanity that you do not naturally understand. Your job as a game designer is to go and fill those blind spots. Fill them in with data, however you possibly can. At this point, you've got the whole message of the talk. If, you, if you're welcome to go. <laughs> that's, that's my entire message, really. <laughs> fill your empathy blind spots, okay? now. I have a tool that I built to make it easier for you because it's kind of a pain in the ass, okay? It's really hard, it's really hard to do. And I have a technique that I randomly, I don't know if invented is quite the right word, stumbled on, um, uh, it's called player acting. I call it player acting. Uh, um, so, um, and thanks to Mike, Mike, Mike Caps uh, fixed, the, fixed the name, it's better. Player acting, learn to play as though you were someone else. I'm gonna tell you how I did this. Tell you the story about how I learned to player act. 
Um, when I was a young designer, way back when we were making games out of sticks and each other's you know, femurs, um, I was working at a large multinational corporation that was very different from the large multinational corporation that I work at now. Um, and I attended this, this conference, in fact. And I encountered, for the first time in my life, several fascinating uh, theories. The Bartle types. First of all, who's familiar? Are you guys familiar with the Bartle types? All y'all that did not raise your hand, take a picture of this, go and look at the website, and read his paper, and dig in and learn that. <laughs> hey, Bartle types. Fascinating, four different player types, right? Um, explorers, achievers, socializers, killers. I'm not gonna go into detail, but the problem that I had was killers. Killers in the Bartle type are hunting down other players to try and make their experience less fun. <laughs> They're trying to troll you. I do not understand. I don't get this. Why? Why would you ever do such a thing? I don't get it. I don't have it in me. Okay? Nicole Lazaro's stuff. You guys know Nicole Lazaro's stuff? The four fun keys? Yes? Again, homework for you. That's the reason I put the link on the bottom. <laughs> four fun keys. The emotions of play. Okay? This is great stuff. This talks about the feelings that we have when we are having fun. Right? Um, I found it incredibly inspiring. Um, curiosity, relaxation, fear, and amusement. People fun. Nicole's up there and she's talking about people fun. This is the fun that you have with other people. <laughs> I don't understand this. I explain this to me. I grew up in my, you know, my basement bedroom making D and D modules for myself. <laughs> so, other people make my game less fun. But <laughs> what's? The, I don't get it. Um, uh, Mark LeBlanc, eight kinds of fun. Um, he had this list uh, of of different types of fun that he described. One of them was called submission, game as a mindless pastime. And I knew, I, immediately, I was like, yes, that's really cool, but how do I explain this to people? Because everyone would say, well, work's not fun. Well, yes, it is, but no, it's not. Okay, so this was my problem. How do I learn all this? How do I make sense of this? And this was in the Dark Ages. So, uh, but fortunately, I was working at a large multinational co corporation, and they had this thing called the IRC. Information, this is not an actual photograph of the IRC. That is not actually me. But it was kind of like that. The IRC contained every video game that had been released, roughly, of, of, of merit uh, over the last 10 years. And since this was in 1874, you can imagine that the games were, you know, there was a lot of them. Um, and I was thinking about how I could do this, and it just struck me. Okay, how about if I just try it? How about if I just play these games as though I were those types that I don't understand? What if I just faked it? What would happen? Okay? So... I picked an archetype, I pretended to play as that archetype for a single session, and then the next session, I would pick a new archetype. Now, of course, given that I am who I am, uh, and I am in the high achiever category, I went through the entire library uh, alphabetically and played every game that they had over the course of two and a half years. So, uh, it's a little extreme, it's not actually necessary for you to go that far. Um, and I can tell you that if you do this, and this is my pitch is that you do, um, or something like it, <laughs> play games that you don't like, that's really the pitch. Um, if you do this, um, you're gonna find that it's less fun than it sounds, <laughs> okay? <laughs> to get a sense of that, imagine going to, e to uh, you know, the game store, right? And just starting at one end of the shelf and playing all the way through to the other end. You're gonna play a lot of games that are not very good, that weren't really done, and that aren't in your genre, right? So, I had to make a couple of rules. Four games a week per minimum. I had to force myself to play at least four games a minute, four, four games per minimum. I gave myself one hour of playtime. It was required. And if I saw a new thing, if I had a new insight while playing, I would force myself to play another hour. And then I was on my own, own recognizance. Okay? So those are the rules. One hour, and then if you learn something, keep going. All right. Well, what did I learn? Well, first thing. I was a quake guy, <laughs> okay? I really liked the, the fast, hyper-real shooters. And I gotta tell you, those World War II shooters, pretty cool. Took me a while to learn that, but that's okay, because I was played, after the seventh World War II shooter that I played in a row, uh, I started to understand that instead of those guns feeling kind of heavy and clunky and kind of bangity-bang and weird, right? 
I started to realize that it was the same gun I had seen in every game. And instead of understanding that that was a bad thing, I began to understand that that familiarity was its own form of fun. Realism <laughs> is not boring. Who knew? <laughs> I had no idea. It was a bit of a revelation. And no, I actually play these games. Second thing, I played everything with Barbie in the title, okay? <laughs> and if you only do one thing, I recommend that you do that. Because it's gonna teach you a lot that you did not know about horses, okay? <laughs> okay? They are a really big deal, and they're really cool, actually. They're pretty, it's pretty neat. It's, uh, it's, you know, I'm just gonna leave that there uh, and move on. Um, but serene does not necessarily mean boring, right? Riding through the forest, you know, on a wild stallion does not necessarily mean that the game is not exciting. Lastly, <laughs> who knew The Sims is fun? Uh, <laughs> Uh, I got badly hooked, actually. Um, but I would never have played this game, because I'm a story guy. I'm a d and I love setting, world, context, all of those things. And I saw The Sims, and I was like, that's a dollhouse. Why, do I, what do I, why would I want to do that? Well, now I get it, because it's a dollhouse. See, <laughs> it's cool. You make your own story, right? <laughs> no story does not necessarily mean boring. OK, so hopefully, by now, it's all clear. That is the technique. It's just that. Player acting for developing accurate um, empathy. That's cool. Took me two and a half years. Hopefully it wouldn't take you that long. The question you need to answer is, which games? Which games, which motivations, right? What do we play? What's a faster way to do this, right? Fortunately, we have this cool map. We have a map. We have a correlated, scientifically validated, whoa, scientifically validated map that connects game mechanics to uh, player personality type. So let's take a look at that map. Fasten your seatbelt. <laughs> this is gonna get a little technical. Uh, okay. That was, uh, let's roll, let's, let's do this. All right, people. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to build a grid. I'm gonna put novelty, the openness factor, here. I'm gonna put challenge here. I'm gonna put stimulation here, and I'm gonna put harmony here, okay? This is what we're gonna do. We're gonna build a map. These are those four categories that correlate with people's preferences. We've left neuroticism to the side. I'm gonna do this. And so we're gonna fill these up with information that helps you guys understand and sort of practice the idea of what these all are. Remember as we're going through this, everyone has scores and everyone, every game has value in all four categories, right? This is a four-way score. Huh? Okay, clear. Okay, how did I get here? So I had to cross over an important problem. I mentioned at the very beginning that each of these domains is actually six individual facets. So, of course, this is, a, this is exactly what we want. We want 24 individual things that you have to measure, me memorize, right? Isn't that perfect? 24 different arc No, this is not what we want. So I spent a good part of last year trying to figure out how to reduce this, right? And I came along, came across the following question. I want to ask myself, are there primary motivations for gaming? The question that I would ask in my test is, what feature would make you put the controller down? What feature will make you stop playing this game? Right? As an example, realism or fantasy? People would generally say yes. People who like realism tend to not want to play the fantasy games. People who play the fantasy games tend to not want to play the realism games. But if I say artistry, artistry, beautiful graphics. There are a lot of people like beautiful graphics. People like you know, the technical accomplishment. But they don't tend to put the controller down for that. You don't tend to buy a game because it's the great graphics genre. Right? So I made that distinction with my, with my test subjects. And in that process, my 24 went to eight. It's pretty cool, actually. Yeah, pull them right out. So now I have two per um, domain. Building a map, trying to build a tool. So here they are, realism versus fantasy. Building versus exploring. And if you're interested in how these correlations actually work, that was in the talk last year. So it's in the vault, uh, and it's et cetera. That's, this is what the talk last year was all about. <laughs> so I'm not gonna go into too much detail on this. Easy versus hard. Work or grinding or sort of effort play, doing the same thing repetitive versus impulse play, chasing thing, doing whatever I want. 
Groups versus solo. Thrilling versus serene. Versus, um, serene. PVP versus team or group dynamic. You know, that, we'll talk about that one in a minute. And then context versus mechanics. So out of the 30 facets of the big five, these appear to be the eight primary motivations that correlate with the following elements of games that mean the most to your players in terms of wanting to be satisfied. So this gives us a map to gamers' brains, maybe. Now, I'm not saying that the other facets don't matter, they do, and that was the whole point of the previous talk. So <laughs> I'm trying to simplify this to create a tool for, to help guide us forward. So. Now, we have two facets, we have two spectrums um, per um, quadrant there. And of course, me being a designer and an old programmer, I know exactly what to do with those. We're going to turn them into graphs. Yes, yes, oh, glorious. Oh, so the, the day that this popped into my head, I was like, oh, it happened. Uh, <laughs> In fact, there, there may be some selection bias here, I'm going to admit to that, because it's, it's a little bit too elegant, right? <laughs> it can't possibly be that clean, right? So I'm just going to cop to that. Okay, so I'm going to go through each one of them quickly. Novelty, fantasy, north-south. Fantasy versus realism, and exploration versus building. It's weird that exploration and building are, are opposed to each other, but I can tell you in my test, they seem to be. There are people who want to do both. There are, I'm not saying that the extremes are all that matter. In fact, each of these are a bell-shaped curve of distribution across the population, okay? So most of the people are going to be kind of in the middle. But the opinion, the people who have stronger scores, like on the, real, real, on, the, on the sides, tend to be more interested in that. That tends to be really important to them. Okay, so our fantasy explorer. Our fantasy explorer is Alice in Wonderland, okay, who will go right down the rabbit hole. Uh, and, and after anything, she will drink anything she comes across, right? <laughs> Totally psyched to go wherever she goes, right? She might kind of complain about it a little bit, but eh, you know. Our realism explorer is going to be Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock, who is always after the real truth, the actual events, right? None of this fiffy fantasy foofery, none of that. Our uh, realism builder is going to be Samwise Gamgee, who, uh, after the greatest adventure of all time, just really wanted to go home garden, that's really all he wanted to do, was go home. And then our um, fantasy builder um, is going to be Tony Stark, uh, <laughs> our, uh, who, will, who is happy to make everything in the Stark Tower that doesn't exist. That's really his main focus of invention, all of the non-existing things. So, what do these people want to play? So these are our four archetypes. And again, I'm giving you a guide, right? I think you get that, but just to be totally clear, these are guides to understanding these people. People who have scores in these quadrants tend to identify with these characters. That's the idea. So what do they play? What do they play? What does Alice in Wonderland play? Well, she plays Skyrim. <laughs> That's what she does, right? And I gotta tell you, if you're going to play Skyrim as Alice in Wonderland, you don't get to fight very much, okay? What you have to do is get off the roads. You have to fill up the map. You have to go for the found 500 things achievement. Right? Explore the world. Um, Sherlock Holmes is a big fan of Phoenix Wright. <laughs> Objection! <laughs> he is on to the truth. <laughs> um, Realism Explorer. This is also a way of indicating that exploration does not necessarily only mean going over the hill. It can be exploring an idea, it can be investigation, right? Those things. Uh, <laughs> Sam is a big fan of Anno. Not the 2070 version, right? The historical version, right? Where you're, where, you're, where you're constructing a real colony, and the more realistic it is, the better, right? Uh, that's, uh, that's what Sam likes to play. And then Tony Stark uh, likes to, you know, play StarCraft II. StarCraft II, only single player, however. Only single player, because multiplayer is a completely different experience. The fantasy builder in the StarCraft experience is I sit on my base, and I collect all the hard, and I build all the way through the whole tech tree, and then I explore that area. But it's the same kind of map, right? I'm really not going anywhere. I'm building. I'm not exploring. That's what StarCraft attracts those kinds of players. A couple of more examples just to give you an idea that not everything goes on the, on the top. If we were just to talk about um, pure um, uh, fantasy games, but with exploration and building in it, Minecraft is a great example of that. Um, 
And uh, uh, for the exploration side, uh, realism is going to be Madden, right? Realism is a, is a game that, that both uh, Sherlock and uh, <laughs> Sam can agree on. Okay. So, so I'm going to put that there. Okay. That's quadrant one. Done. And you can see where this is going. So, I told you to fasten your seatbelts. <laughs> okay. <laughs> quadrant two. Challenge, which deals with our ability to... Um, uh, control our impulses. Okay, so a skill, skilled play is our north-south axis. Less skilled play is on the bottom. And I say less skilled because I don't mean suck. Okay, that's, that's not what I mean. <laughs> ah, I forgot to do something. I'm going to go back for just a minute. I forgot an important step here. We, over, we skipped an important step. I want to do... Okay, quick test. Fantasy versus realism. Fantasy. Excellent. Realism. Look around. Look around. The population of the human race is evenly distributed. <laughs> Games industry is not. <laughs> That's important information for you. <laughs> Exploration versus building. Explorers. Would, this is explorers. You want to go over the hill first. Not that you don't want to build, but you want to go over the hill first. Builders. I would rather stay and build my farm first. More evenly distributed. Not surprising. Yeah? We tend to agree on that, and we don't criticize the builders versus the exploration game, do we? We sure do criticize the realistic ones, though. <laughs> That's my little guilt trip for the... You know, the <laughs> okay, and I'm going to roll forward onto... Ah, okay, so we're going to do it again. Skilled play versus less skilled play. So, hard players, hard and normal. If you hit a hard spot, you're going to keep pushing through. You like the challenge of playing a difficult game. You... Nicely done. All right, bravo. Okay, less skilled players. You're going to try it, but, you know, if it gets too hard, you're going to move on, find something more fun. Yeah, a little bit evenly distributed, right? Okay, but more hard, more hard players. Why? Because working in the games industry is hard. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's why. <laughs> Don't forget that. <laughs> Work play on one side. This is grinding. I'm happy to do the, it's the quest in the barrens where you're like, please go find 300 boar tusks. That one. Okay, work play. Impulse play is, I want to do this thing, and this is fun, and I'm going over here, right? Okay, so work players. Work players, work players, grinders. No? Yes, okay, 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 okay. Impulse, impulse players. It's a slight misbalance there. Just going to point that one out. And what else do we criticize? Grinding. We hate it. We don't understand it, do we? We don't get why people would ever do it. That's why we don't understand. Okay? All right. So, skilled play work. Who's our skilled work player? This is Hermione Granger, the masterer. Okay? For obvi obvious reasons, she's the one we always go to when we need a plan, when we need to get something done. She's the only one who knows any of these, any of these spells. The less skilled play, but still persistent grinder. Oh, you're not very good at it, but you're willing to do the work and continue and persist. Oh, poor, poor Ron. It's really, oh, it's brutal. Perseverer is not a word, by the way. I, I just made that up. If anyone has a better idea, I will take your advice after the talk. Um, the less skilled play, impulse player. Right? This is someone who is not very good at games and really just wants to keep... This is the demo, the guy who's downloading all the demos and just trying them out, right? That's the dude. Okay? Okay? It, it fits, doesn't it? <laughs> like, yeah. He's just, he's just on the PSN network downloading everything and trying them for 30 minutes, and then I was like, oh, I don't get it, and then plays something else. He's very satisfied with his life, though. He's happy with that, right? Okay, and then the impulse player, who, the, the, the player who comes in with a high degree of skill and talent but doesn't want to work very hard to get it, right? Just wants to keep going after that. Well, that's going to be Harry. <laughs> Good old Harry, the talent. Now, I actually had a version of this slide where all four characters were Harry Potter characters, and I, I, there was a protest. So, uh, <laughs> um, But Harry Potter is the one. Okay, so what do these, these guys play? What do these guys play? Hermione, as it turns out, is a big fan of Dark Souls. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. The harder, the better. N plus, pl new game plus plus, in fact. Uh, she has all the weapons. Whereas Ron is really more of a Farmville guy. Um, because you don't have to be very good at games to play Farmville, right? 
Now, that is not a criticism. I am level 68 in Farmville. Yeah, uh, I want that time of my life back. Um, okay, uh, the dude, our, our less skilled player, um, is a big fan of The Sims, and if you're going to play The Sims in this way in order to understand this character, you have to play with the all-money cheat. Okay, no effort. You just This is where you get, you give yourself a billion simoleons, and you just do whatever in the hell you want to until you're bored with that. Okay, it is that style of play. It is not all of the quests and the goals and all of that stuff that satisfies the other side. Okay? That's specifically what we're talking about. And then Harry, with his impulse skilled play, he really just wants to be Dante. Really a Devil May Cry guy. Fwah! Blam, 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 blam! I'm awesome. <laughs> they both agree on Super Meat Boy, though, because that's that one's hard, right? But you can kind of go as you like. And then if, if you want to play a game that is just about, you know, low, low skill play, have you guys played Level Star, Lego Star Wars? It's fantastic. Fantastic fucking game. Really, really great. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to put that one there. Those guys like those games. So that's two. Stimulation. Stimulation deals with um, stimulation. Uh, so uh, it deals with two factors. North-South is multiplayer versus solo play. At the high end of the score, this is people who enjoy raids. You know, 40-person 40, 40 groups are okay and prefer to play with four or five people. That's usually the, the kinds of numbers that you get for uh, people with a high score in that. And solo, of course, are like people. Why are there people in my game? So multiplayer, multiplayer, group players, people who like other people. Uh, we had a few ads there, weren't there? Yeah. You guys are in the middle. You guys are the scores. Solo players. Me too. Look around. Boy, there's a lot. You know why? Yes, you know why. Because we didn't have any friends. <laughs> okay. But this is why we're trying to solve this problem, why it's hard for us to understand multiplayer. Okay. Excitement versus serenity. It's exactly that. It's boom, versus wee, ba -woo, ba -ba. Excitement players. Excitement players. You like the thrill, the roller coaster. Serenity. Serenity players. A little more evenly split, but still uh, some missing ones. Again, not surprising. It fits our expectation. Yeah? We like excitement because being in the games industry is really hard. Um, <laughs> okay. So our multiplayer excitement player. Okay, likes lots of people and loves having a good time. Yeah, that's going to be Austin Powers. Uh, yeah, baby. Okay, for obvious reasons. Um, our excitement solo player, um, the, the person who loves to have a great time uh, but really wants to just go alone. Well, we know this guy. That's the lone wolf. That is, uh, that is Wolverine. That is Wolverine, absolutely. Um, the solo serenity player, the player who wants to just play quietly by themselves alone on their own swamp planet is Yoda, Yoda, excitement, <laughs> it, I'm not going to finish it, okay, I'm done, uh, I'm done with that, serenity, uh, serenity multiplayer, I like to play with people, I love people, people are the most important thing, but I really just wish we could all just have a peaceful environment, that's going to be Professor, uh, Professor X, right, now I point out that this, I use this as an example to say that it, um, serenity does not necessarily mean won't kick your ass, Right? Just means that he would prefer to not kick your ass first. Right? Okay, so what games do these guys play? Um, turns out uh, Austin Powers uh, is a big Call of Duty fan. Uh, multiplayer only. Multiplayer only. Right? But he's also a big fan of a whole other genre, which also it com fits completely in the, excitement, in the excitement category, which is Just Dance. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Party game, perfect. So he's, uh, he's split on those, right? Um, uh, Wolverine, uh, also a big fan of uh, Call of Duty. Single player only, okay? <laughs> um, and if he ever tries the multiplayer mode, he's playing alone, right? He's, he's maybe uh, joining that, okay? Uh, Yoda, he's a big fan of flower. It's perfect, gentle, serene, single player experience. Ah, uh, uh, the words and the bees. Serenity multiplayer, a gentle, calm game that involves other people. That's a tough one. Second Life, maybe, but it's kind of ew right now. <laughs> I mean, I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, I'm all for it, but still. Uh, maybe Animal Crossing, right? 
maybe, if you're playing with friends. And so if you want to learn how to play, if you want to learn how Professor Xavier likes to play, you gotta play Animal Crossing, but you gotta play with your friends, man. You gotta, you gotta set it up so you're all living in one town or something, okay? I often, am, people uh, often mention Journey uh, in this one, right? And Journey is right in the middle. It's really odd. It's between solo and multiplayer, and it's only ever two people, okay? So don't, don't, don't confuse co-op for multiplayer. They're different. They're actually different things, okay? So I'm gonna put that there. Those guys like that game. One more to go. Doing pretty good. Harmony, Harmony. Harmony deals with social interaction. How do we interact with each other? The rules of engagement, is, um, so to speak. So team and PVP. Um, team actually is not always, it's not just team deathmatch, although it is team deathmatch. I find that people who like to play multiplayer competitive games will play this game in team deathmatch. But it's also, I just want to feel that my contribution is part of a larger contribution, working with other people. Whereas PVP people want you to lose. <laughs> okay? <laughs> I want to win that way. So team, team players. I love you. You're my people. <laughs> PVP. PVP. Oh, yeah, okay. Steve Moretzky is a PVP player. I'm not surprised. <laughs> okay. <laughs> PVP players. <laughs> uh, all right. I thought that was, that's, that's so funny. It was, uh, it was fewer of those than is often common. It must be because of the psychology interest. I don't know. Maybe you're a nicer bunch. Who knows? That's my bias coming out, by the way. <laughs> I think team is important. Context versus mechanics. This one is really, this was really hard to find. Um, in fact, this is, this is the difference between I want to understand how the game and what's important to me is that we're playing the rules and that's all I care about. I care that I win or lose and I care about the way that that system works. Context is I care about why. What's the world? What's the people? What's happening, right? What's at stake, right? It's tough. This is a tough one. It's a tough one. Okay. So the question to, and the question to ask, you, ask yourself is, is if if the if your favorite game that has a story, well, I'm not going to go through that. Anyway, you guys are going to figure it out. Context. Context people. Mechanics people. Pretty evenly split. Not surprising. Not surprising. That's consistent. Games industry. Okay. So, who are our people? Team versus context. A team context player. Someone who wants to know why. Right, and someone who's all about the team and positive, that's gonna be Mickey Mouse, okay? Mickey is always interested to hear what's going on with you. It's all good, and I'm specifically talking about the Kingdom Hearts 2 Mickey Mouse, by the way, who's a badass. I don't know if you've played that game, but King Mickey, man, I would not wanna cross that guy, Whew. Uh, But he'll come roaring to your defense. Uh, context PVP, one versus one players who wanna make sure that the other guy goes down, but cares very much about what's at stake and why. That's gonna be the Jedi. There are many Jedi that could fit this slot, but of course I picked Qui-Gon Jinn because he wears his hair the same way that I do. <laughs> Makes him instantly more noble, yes? <laughs> He's actually the gray side of the forest, Qui-Gon. That's why I like him. Uh, PvP and just mechanics. Don't care why. Don't care why. Just want to beat you up. Really? Just want an excuse to kill you. Gummy snake. Snake Plissken, who, in order to care about a single human being, had to have explosives planted in his neck <laughs> tied to that person's heartbeat. And it was the President of the United States, I would remind you. Snake Plissken, and he still fucked him at the end, right? <laughs> Oops, I swore in the States. Okay. Um, <laughs> did you guys play Far Cry 3? Yes. Um, Mechanics, mechanics team, team players who just want to get the job done and don't actually care that much about why, they're really just at it, that's going to be Nick Fury, right? Who is all about the team, all about the world, all about what we're doing, right? But actually, what's at stake? It's good to know, and he knows it, but really, it's all about getting it done. Execution, soldier, sport, knight, killer, soldier. So what do they play? Whew, man. So Mickey's a tough one, and at the end of the day, here is, the, here is what I have learned. Team context people tend to fall in two categories, but it's really the same game with or without real human beings. RPGs and then RPGs in an MMO setting. <laughs> uh, and you can look at the extra version, the stuff, I remember multiplayer versus solo, to find out which one of these are gonna fall into, right? But in an RPG, we are doing a thing, generally, right? And if you don't like other people, you have all these fake people <laughs> that we are doing things with, which is great. I love them. This is why I played them all in my life. Um, okay, 
Uh, context PVP, I want to hunt you down and kill you, but I want to understand why. That's going to be EVE Online. Okay. Great setting. Can you imagine Qui-Gon playing EVE? It's really easy for me. I really can. I really, it's, just not, it's not much of a stretch. Um, uh, PVP mechanics, um, PVP versus mechanics, it's going to be Quake, uh, Quake 3 Arena. Real deathmatch, not team deathmatch. Real deathmatch, right? 1v1, one, one winner, that style of deathmatch. That is all Snake plays, and that's, really, it's, that's awesome. That's what he does. And then team, um, where the mechanics are really the whole thing and really just playing the game, it's going to be League of Legends. Nick is a gigantic League of Legends fan. He's, uh, you know, he's level 30, and he's uh, moving up on the leaderboards, and, but he does curse a lot. He really is he's getting downvoted a great deal. Okay. Uh, top um, uh, sort of context, uh, sort of uh, team games, Little Big Planet, PvP, pure PvP games is going to be like Street Fighter. These are kind of examples that they can agree on. Okay, so I'm going to put that there. Okay, that's it. That's my chart. That's what I've done. That's the work. This was the last year of my freaking life. Um, that and the game that I'm working on. Okay, so Dan Hay. You remember Dan Hay? I'm Dan Hay. Hi, I'm Dan Hay. I love Dan, by the way. I'm, he's going to murder me if he sees this talk. But I do love him. I love you, Dan. Please don't kill me. Uh, What's it good for? Well, Dan, we all have these empathy blind spots, you see. We have these spots in our brain where we don't naturally understand other human beings. And because we're designers, that's not okay. We're not allowed to live our life that way. It's just not cool. So we have this map that shows us about all the different types of humanity and that the, the, it's specifically what they care about the most in games as a place to start, as a place to get started. There's more detail in here, and you can use other psychological systems, and right, there's lots of that, but this is, you know, I'm trying to boil this down to a place to start. So as an example, if I were to take my scores, this is me. I am a, I am a Tony Stark, Hermione Granger, Wolverine, Mickey Mouse. <laughs> I'm kind of a badass. Right? Uh, and the thing is, it's actually really true. Uh, it's really, I, when I see these scores, I'm like, yeah, actually, that's really how I play. I play like those people. I really do. So, that's me. That's me. That is the reduction of, of uh, the most important facets of the Big Five into a single 4x4 chart that indicates 16 player archetypes. So that, if Tim Schafer ever decided to make a game for me, and I sure hope he does, because he's... And he does, he has, consistently. He will understand me. Help me develop accurate empathy. The important part in that little grid are not the colors. They're the blank spots. The blank spots are your guide to your homework. Should you choose to accept it, please do. Make us a better industry. Um, so, those games, play those games like those people. Remember player acting? Play those games like you were those people. Play those games as though you were those people. Play these games as though you were those people if you wanted to understand stimulation. If you want to understand harmony, play these games as those people. There are other games. I recommend you play good and bad ones. In fact, I learn more from the bad ones than I do from the good ones. Okay, so. I have 256 player types for you. <laughs> Memorize them all. <laughs> Thing is, it doesn't actually matter. Player types, it's a, it's a mnemonic for us to kind of begin to memorize, right? Um, and the point is that number, 256, it begins, it begins to feel right to me as an estimation for the kind of variety that I see in this room and the kind of variety that I understand in my daily life and the kind of variety I see in the human species, okay? It isn't enough for us to be designing our games from from small selections and large divisions. It's, it works, I'm not saying don't do it. I'm not, I put those other models in there because I revere the people who have, who have done them, right? They are also useful because they are talking about things that divide nicely into four things. But if you want to understand human beings as a race, as a, as a species, right? If you want to understand that, you need to have a number kinda like that. 100, more than 100 types, <laughs> okay? because we are an incredibly varied group. There are things that we agree on, and this is where I'm going to be going in the future. There are things that we agree on. Self-determination theory is a great example of the kinds of motivations that we all have. Mastery, we all want to get better. Autonomy, we all want to be free. 
et cetera, relatedness. We all want to know where we are. It's, but that's for later. So this is a map to help you develop accurate empathy so that you can make great games, so that I can play them. <laughs> OK. <laughs> um, so what's next? What's next for me? Um, more focused quantitative study. The studies, the numbers that I gave you were done at the, at the domain level. The studies that I, what we did was just a rough shot to see if there was any validity to the theory. There is validity to the theory. So I'm going to continue to, do, to drill down and create um, tests that validate um, um, more, um, more deeply. And the other one, you remember this question, what's it good for? I've started hitting this new question because now people, I think I'm excited because I get positive feedback. People are starting to use it. They're excited about it. But I start getting asked this other new weird question. Well, are you using it on your game? Are you using it on your game? Yes, I am. <laughs> I am going to use this on my game. But here's the thing. So are you. Everyone's doing this. We all use this every day. This is not a checklist. It's not a tool. Psychology will not be that. It's not going to be something that's going to be proven. Okay? I'm not going to give you a tool that you can just say, yep, I should use the big five, and my sales will go up. Not going to happen. Doesn't work that way. Psychology, human psychology, developing empathy is a way of improving you as a designer. And you, as a better designer, will naturally make your game better. Does it work? Of course it works. Of course it works. You can do what I've done with any psychological theory of merit. Okay? It, they all count. My message is develop yourself, because <laughs> it's your job. <laughs> you, you took the entertainer's covenant. You owe it to your audience to understand them. And you can choose to not. I will preempt the first question that I know I'm going to be asked, which is, well, isn't this just a checklist in order to make sure that you can cover the whole bases and make every game the same? No, it's not. I'm giving you the tools to choose who you want to make your game for so that you're not making that choice accidentally or randomly, which is the danger. That's when you fail, is when you accidentally make a game for a different group than you wanted to. That's my talk. Thanks for coming. Appreciate it. Um, We've got about 10 minutes for Q&A. Please fill out your, uh, your f um, reviews for the thing. Please, you're going to get an email for about you know, stuff. Please tell them that I was terrible, and then you know, I won't come back. Uh, and you should turn off all your cell phones, because it'll mess with my microphone. No, I should have said that before. That was, uh, <laughs> dang. OK, so Q&A, go. And right in the mic. Thank you. Yes. Is this working? All right. Uh, Thank you so much. This is really informative. Uh, I loved all the list of games you had. Yes. Um, I have a feeling there's about 10 billion more games than you just listed. Yes. Have you, uh, do you have like a more extensive list, or have you thought about crowdsourcing out, like, hey, help me identify all these games, because I don't have time to play all these games, that and is, no, you don't. So. That is actually, in fact, I, I, uh, I asked uh, my Twitter, uh, I asked, I, I'm trying to figure out Twitter, and uh, um, Brian Green said, said, actually, oh, no, it wasn't Brian, it was Rafe Coster. He said, he said, you know what you should do is you should ask Twitter about games for all of your types. So yes, I think it's a brilliant idea. Um, this is my initial list. I just wanted to have a, a, a template to get you guys started, but I would love to uh, to see it go wider, get a longer list. Go ahead. Oh, thank you for the talk. It was amazing. You're welcome. Um, have you done any research into the proportions of players that fit into those different categories? So it the proportions of humanity that fits into those categories is that it's 25% in each category, because that's how the Big Five was built. The Big Five was built to be a standard distribution across all, across all populations, which is why I'm so excited about using it as a foundation for this research, right? Because we know right from the get-go that that's humanity. As far as players go, don't have any data on that right now. Um, I would love to. That would be a really cool study, right? That would be really super neat. Um, yeah. <laughs> so we're, that would be kind of cool. Like, we could do that, in fact. We could do it. Do you have any tips for turning off the designer portion of your brain in order to do this research, because I've, every time I play a game, I sit down and go, oh, I can't beat this puzzle. And I go, oh, wait, think like a designer. Up oh, there it is. Yeah. And so, yeah, <laughs> in coming um, across that. Yes, I'll give you a few tips. Um, drink. OK. <laughs> right. no, play drunk. Yeah. Okay. Actually, not kidding. So, yeah. <laughs> um, and just distract yourself in a variety of ways. Play with the radio on. I don't know. 
Yeah, uh, and practice, 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 practice. You just get better at it as you do it. I, found I was hard at first and it gets easier. It's a skill, it's actually a skill, and it's a skill that I continue to do. I continue to practice, so it's a, uh, it's a long-term study. Yeah, but drinking first is a great place to start, absolutely. I, I advocate that um, thoroughly. Okay, are we good? Thank you all, take care. Oh, it's okay.